when I was a young adult, I, uh, I did play Little League Baseball. Wasn't very good at it. I was good at taking a pitch into the belly. That happened frequently, <laughs> but I still loved it. I played church basketball. And I loved it. I loved every bit of it. I, and I, with the basketball part of it, in our backyard, we, I talked earlier about the, the multi-tier. Well, we had patio, a cement patio out there, and we had, I, I, for the longest time, I wanted a basketball stand and I had to build my own. So I, I went and got some two by fours and I put them all together and, and made it tall enough that I could put it into the ground so far and cement it. I had to buy my own little bag of cement and put it in. Then I, I realized that it was the end of the patio and across the patio was a telephone wire or some kind of weather. I don't know, I don't know it was a power line or whatever, but it constantly got in the way of me trying to shoot a basketball. So, you know, I, I could do layups okay but that wire was getting in the way. So I practiced on shooting over the wire and getting it to swish into the hoop. And so when I'm playing church ball, I'm a short guy, I'm really little. I'll never forget this one game I was playing and it was before the three point line in, in basketball. And um, they put me in, I don't know why, cause you was like said, I'm a short guy, but they put me in and, and in this particular game, I just stood on the outside and I got the ball once and I put the, I, just this high arching shot and it swished. And I did that, I scored a total, I'll never forget, 18 points in that game. Um, that means I made nine shots from the outside and they were all high arching shots like I'm standing on my patio shooting over this uh, telephone wire to make it work. Other, other things I like to do, um, as I mentioned before, I like golf, I love to play golf. I'm not really great at it, but I still love to play it. But when I was a junior in high school, I was into my second year of high school and I, and I was walking to school one day, like I always did, and a friend of mine pulled up in his little convertible and asked me if I wanted to ride to, to school. And I said, sure. And as we're riding the rest of the way to school, he said, have you thought about joining the cross country team? And I said, not much. I haven't thought about it at all. And he said, will you come with me after school today? We could really leave you on the team. He said, you walk back and forth from school every single day, you're, you're going to be in good shape to run cross country. That was a bit of a struggle because I, the only shoes I had for running cross country were my tracks from Kmart. They weren't the best shoes to be running a lot of miles in. So I had to, my dad did buy me some good running shoes, my first pair of Nikes and whatnot. And so, but I, I loved running cross country. It was, it was hard at first, but it got, you know, through the hard work we did, it, it got funner and funner. We never, in the time I was in the, the cross country program, we never lost a dual meet. We did take second in, in a couple invitationals, but the, the funnest thing to remember is that in, in our junior year, my first year of running, we ran with uh, a, a guy named Ed Eyestone, who turned out to be a pre, uh, an Olympian twice, an amazing runner. And he, uh, um, he, finished first place in a state championship and then the rest of the team just followed me. So we won our first state championship when I was a junior with Ed Eystone. The fun thing about running with Ed is in our practices, we'd, we'd go on probably a five or 10 mile run and, and he was always ahead of us and he'd stop to get his rest and we'd catch up to Ed and he'd start running again. <laughs> and so we, we built a lot of stamina from, because if we wanted to be close enough to Ed, we didn't get a lot of chance to rest. So we were just back on the track road going and every night he changed a different route. He was the one that was leading us and we were following. And, but I love to tell people that I ran with an Olympian. <laughs> the things I learned in high school that were important for me is, is to try, try to be part of something. To be part of a, whether it's a group like with the cross country team, I was part of something. I didn't want to be a loner. I didn't want to be that person who was just hanging in my head and being, feeling sorry for myself. I wanted to be part of something. So you know, I didn't do the, the cross country thing until my junior year, but in my sophomore year, it was banned. We had the opportunity in the summer before my sophomore year, or the summer before my junior year, we, uh, we went to, our band went to Calgary, Alberta, or Alberta, Canada, where, you know, Calgary, up there now in, in Canada. And we, we marched in the uh, Cal Calgary Stampede Parade. And we took second place out of nine bands. And uh, the, it was amazing. 
it truly was amazing. Just uh, fun to be in, just uh, learning how to, you know, do parade marching and then learning how to do marching in a, in a uh, football setting where, you know, we, we followed a routine. But it was the, the important part was I was part of something. I was so glad I had that in, the, in my high school because I was kind of a, in junior high, I was kind of a loner and just did, hung around, didn't do a whole lot of things with people. I had a few friends, but most of the time I just kept to myself. And walking to high school for the first couple, year and a half of high school, that was just me doing my, way, my own thing, you know. And, and my good friend Craig picked me up one day and, and introduced me to uh, cross country, and I'll, I love it. So, I, I know if you look at this, you know I don't love it so much anymore, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, the funny thing about band is I never, I can't read music. That might surprise you, because I cannot read music. I memorized the, the positions. I, looking at the music, I knew what position went with what particular note. And I will never forget in my junior year, my uh, band instructor, uh, Dr. Lund, he called everybody by their last name. And he said, McBride, pay me, play me a C-sharp scale. I don't know if there was a C-sharp scale at that time, but I couldn't because I didn't know what it was. I didn't, you know, I couldn't read music. To this day, I cannot read music. But I loved being in band. And but he told me I had two weeks to learn how to read music or I'd have to quit. And so I just quit on the spot. <laughs> so, but it was okay. Um, I still loved being in band. And then he came up to me at the beginning of the basketball season and he said, I need a baritone player for basketball. Are you willing to be on the, on the um, pet band? And I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> I said, I need a baritone though. And he said, you, you have one at your disposal, just have your own, own uh, mouthpiece and come on back. And I did, so I never did learn how to read music. Out of the three boys in our family, I was the only one to have be able to graduate from school. The other two, for whatever reason, dropped out. They were both very smart. They had good grades and they just dropped out. They quit. So I had to work so much harder than they had to work to get to where I was going to graduate. And, and um, so when, you know, when graduation came, I did, I was allowed so many invitations and my dad didn't want to come. He chose not to come. That was his choice. I, that's okay. And, and my mom, she was there, and I believe my grandparents on my dad's side showed up. Um, but my mom, we were outside of the tabernacle. All back then, it, was a, a, it wasn't really a church and state thing back then, you know. So all the local, unless there was a Catholic school, all the local schools, would, their graduation ceremony was done in the tabernacle down by the, next to the Ogden Temple. And uh, so we're down there on the temple grounds, and. And my mom came up and she said, she gave me the biggest hug that I think I ever got from her. And she says, you're the best mistake I ever made. And that stung to hear that. Because I already knew. I already knew that I wasn't intended. I was 11 months younger than my brother. I mean, who does that? So I knew when, when I heard that, it just really stung to the point that I, I held it against her for almost 20 years. It just really, really bothered me that she would confirm what I already knew. And um, it, w it was actually causing some problems in our marriage uh, because I was, I was struggling with this, uh, this dilemma, so to speak. So I went to get some counseling and my counselor told me that I needed to write my mom a letter and he said, you don't have to send it to her. You just need to write it. That's your therapy, is write this letter. And I can't tell you how many pages it was or anything like that, I don't remember. But I remember when I finished writing it, I told my wife that I need to call my mom and read this letter to her. I have to, that's the only way I'm gonna get over it. And so when I called my mom and I said, mom, I gotta talk to you. And I said, I know it's what I'm gonna say throughout this time is gonna hurt you and I'm not trying to, I don't wanna hurt you but you need to know. And I said, I wrote a letter to you and I'm not gonna mail it to you, but I wanna read it to you. And so I read it to her and she said, when I got to that part where she said, you're the best mistake I ever made, she goes, oh honey, I would never say that to you. And I said, you did say that to me. And she said, I, I didn't mean you as a mistake. I was so proud of you. You're the only 
kid of mine that graduated high school. I was so proud of you. And, and I said, well, that's so good to hear. <laughs> I, you know, I knew that I was a mistake. She, oh, you weren't a mistake. You weren't a mistake. You just weren't planned. <laughs> so she was really emphasizing that a mistake was probably the wrong word to use, you know. And, and I look back on that, and her and I had a really pretty good relationship after that. And she's still with us, but she's not with us. She's, she's suffering through the grips of dementia right now. And, and so I, I know our relationship continues. I know she can't verbally com commun uh, communicate with me, but I know twice in the last 18 months I had an incredible experience with her. The first one was back in November of 2022. Her sister, my Aunt Denise, who, who was just 70 years old, uh, got lung cancer and passed away. And so we were at the funeral. She would be there with my stepdad, and I was there with my wife. And, and I just happened to notice that my mom was really, really struggling to stand still. She couldn't stand still because of the dementia. She had to be moving around. So I just went up to her. And I don't think I've ever called my mom, Mama, until this one moment. And I reached down and I held her hand and I said, it's okay, Mama, I'm here for you. And she literally, her hand just melted in my hand. She just calmed right down. And I'll never, I'll never forget that. My stepdad did not know because he couldn't hear me say that to her. Her reaction was a direct result of me calling her mama and holding her hand. And then last October, October 1st of 2023, we went down to Utah for a family reunion and we had the opportunity to go visit with my, my mom and my stepdad. And so when I walked in, she was sitting on her couch and so I got, put my hands on my knees and bent down so she could make eye contact with me. And I said, hi mama, I'm here to visit you. And she went, ah! and then got this big smile on her face. And I looked at my stepdad and he said, she has never done that. That's amazing. She recognizes you. There's part of me that believes that it wasn't me she was recognizing, and I'm okay with that. My brother Corey had passed away back in 2008, and she had a tough time dealing with his death. And, and I was able to talk to her a few times about, about his death. And, and so I believe we were close enough in age that we looked alike. We both had red hair. We both, you know, so I, I believe that day it was my brother that she was seeing, and I'm okay with that. I truly am. Um, I'll, I'll never forget, um, excuse me, when he'd been dead about six months, she called me and she said, I can't get over this. I don't know how to, to deal with this. I said, what do you need, Mom? What's going on? She said, nobody can tell me why Heavenly Father decided to take him home because his addictions, he had, he had become clean from his addictions and he had found Christ. may not have been through the church of Jesus Christ, but he found Christ, and he was so excited that he had Christ in his life again. He said, and, and so why would God take him? And I said, Mom, that's so, so easy. If you want me to tell you, I'll tell you exactly why. God took him because he was ready to come, because he had cleaned himself up and he wasn't on the drugs anymore. And it was time for him to, you know, he would never, and I did say this to my mom, he will never, he would never have survived his sobriety he would have fallen back into his addiction. I have no doubt that, about my brother on that. And she said, Todd, six months he's been gone and nobody has told me what you just told me. And it makes perfect sense. <laughs>